The first question is, why Walt Whitman at St. Francis College? And actually, that's a very easy answer. Walt Whitman lived and worked in this part of Brooklyn. Indeed, there are buildings that he would still recognize from his day and age. When Walt Whitman lived in Brooklyn, Brooklyn was a city until itself. Brooklyn did not become part of Greater New York until 1898. But Whitman, living here primarily in the 1840s and 1850s, knew it as his city of Brooklyn. So you go right out the front door, make a right-hand turn down Remsen Street, go to Court Street, and there's the building that we call Brooklyn Borough Hall. Whitman intimately knew that building, but he knew it as Brooklyn City Hall. And indeed, when it was being built in the 1840s, uh, Whitman said uh, in his position as the editor of the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, I hope they get the ventilation right. The city hall in New York, the city of New York, has terrible ventilation. I hope we do ventilation better here in Brooklyn. Uh, Walt Whitman's uh, great work, Leaves of Grass, was originally published in Brooklyn in 1855. And it was self-published, but on the cusp, right before the Civil War began in 1860, with the third edition of Leaves of Grass, Walt Whitman actually found a publisher, a publisher in Boston. So he spent several months in Boston, Walt Whitman, where he had meetings with Ralph Waldo Emerson, among others, and uh, putting together the third edition. One of the great segments of poetry, uh, or as Whitman called them, clusters of poetry, which he wrote, are the 45 Calamus poems. And in Calamus number five, called States, uh, he puts out a radical idea to prevent the oncoming civil war. And that is a policy, uh, a, a hope for a radical comradeship of, of men from north and, and south, instead of seeing what separates them, finding what binds them. Late in his life, Whitman shortened this poem to one called, For You, O Democracy. And we're going to have the New York premiere of a song setting by this by composer Zach Redler. In part, the text of this song goes, I will plant companionship thick as trees along all the rivers of America and along the shores of the Great Lakes and all over the prairies. I will make inseparable cities with their arms about each other's necks by the love of comrades by the manly love of comrades. Performing this song, music by Zach Redler, we have bass baritone William Roberts and pianist Myla Henry. Splendid race, the 
sun has ever shone upon. I will make divine, 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 divine magnetic lands with the love of comrades by the life. He felt the year was full of omens, omens maybe good, maybe bad, of things to come. And in this poem, which Katie will next read, uh, we will hear uh, he is alluding to the, the recent events concerning the abolitionist and the hanging of John Brown. He mentions the visit to New York City of the Prince of Wales and the coming into New York Harbor of the biggest ship ever constructed until that time. He also mentions uh, unexpected meteor displays in the skies and a comet. Year of Meteors, 1859 to 1860. Year of Meteors, brooding year. I would bind in words retrospective some of your deeds and signs. I would sing your contest for the 19th Presidentiad. I would sing how an old man, tall, with white hair, mounted the scaffold in Virginia. I was at hand. Silent I stood, with teeth shut closed. I watched. I stood very near you, old man, when cool and indifferent, but trembling with age and your unhealed wounds, you mounted the scaffold. I would sing in my copious song your census returns of the states, the tables of population and products. I would sing of your ships and their cargoes, the proud black ships of Manhattan arriving, some filled with immigrants, some from the isthmus with cargoes of gold. Songs thereof would I sing, to all that hitherward comes would I welcome give. And you would I sing, fair stripling, Welcome to you from me, sweet boy of England. Remember you surging Manhattan's crowds as you passed with your cortege of nobles. There in the crowds stood I and singled you out with attachment. I know not why, but I loved you. And so go forth, little song, far overseas, speed like an arrow, carrying my love all folded, and finds in his palace the youth I love, and drop these lines at his feet. Nor forget I to sing of the wonder, the ship as she swam up my bay. Well shaped and stately, the great eastern swam up my bay. She was 600 feet long. 
her moving swiftly, surrounded by myriads of small craft, I forget not to sing. Nor the comet that came unannounced out of the north flaring in heaven. Nor the strange, huge meteor procession, dazzling and clear, shooting over our heads. A moment, a moment long, it sailed its balls of unearthly light over our heads, then departed, dropped in the night, and was gone. Of such, and fitful as they, I sing. With gleams from them would I gleam and patch these chants, your chants, O year, all mottled with evil and good. Year of forebodings, year of the youth I love. Year of comets and meteors, transient and strange. Lo, even here, one equally transient and strange. As I flit through you hastily, soon to fall and be gone, what is this book? What am I myself but one of your meteors? will be our next reading, and this will be the first of numerous excerpts we will hear from Whitman's prose memoir of the 1882 Specimen Day. Uh, Whitman, in this excerpt, is catching us up on what he's been doing through the 1840s, 1850s. His life passionately changes with the outbreak of the Civil War now uh, uh, over 151 years ago. But it was 150 years ago this month that Walt Whitman's younger brother, George Washington Whitman, was wounded in action fighting for the Union uh, Army, for the Union side. And when Whitman decides that he will go find his brother down in Virginia. Sarah, let's hear these excerpts. Through eight years, in 1848, 1849, I was occupied as editor of the Daily Eagle newspaper in Brooklyn. The latter year went off on a leisurely journey and working expedition, my brother Jeff with me, through all the middle states and down the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. Lived a while in New Orleans and worked there on the editorial staff of Daily Crescent newspaper. After a time, plodded back northward, up the Mississippi and around two, and by way of the Great Lakes, Michigan, Huron, and Erie to Niagara Falls in Lower Canada, finally returning through central New York and down the Hudson, traveling altogether probably 5,000 miles this trip, to and fro. 1851-1853, occupied in house building in Brooklyn, for a little of the first part of that time in printing a daily and weekly paper, The Free Men. 1855, lost my dear father that year by death. Commenced putting leaves of grass to press for good at the job printing office of my friends, the Brothers Rome, in Brooklyn. After many manuscripts, doings and undoings, I had great trouble in leaving out the stock poetical touches, but succeeded at last. I am now, 1856-1857, in my 37th year. In 1862, startled by news that my brother George, an officer in the 51st New York Volunteers, had been seriously wounded, First Fredericksburg Battle, December 13th. I hurriedly went down to the field of war in Virginia, but I must go back a little. I hope you heard that date, December 13th, 1862. Almost 150 years, just 10 days uh, uh, hence from now, will be the 150th anniversary of that. Uh, Michael will now read a poem which sets the change of tone in the country as a country, as the North, uh, gets ready to fight a war. 1861. Armed year, year of the struggle. No dainty rhymes or sentimental love verses for you, terrible year. Not you as some pale poetling seated at a desk, lisping cadenzas piano, but as a strong man, erect, clothed in blue clothes, advancing, carrying a rifle on your shoulder, with well-gristled body and sunburned face and hands, with a knife in the belt at your side, as I heard you shouting loud, your sonorous voice ringing across the continent, your masculine voice, O oh year, as rising amid the great cities, amid the men of Manhattan, I saw you, 
as one of the workmen, the dwellers in Manhattan, or with large steps crossing the prairies out of Illinois and Indiana, rapidly crossing the west with springy gaint and descending the Alleghenies, or down from the Great Lakes, or in Pennsylvania, or on the deck of the Ohio River, or southward along the Tennessee or Cumberland Rivers, or at Chattanooga on the mountaintop, saw I your gait and saw I your sinewy limbs, clothed in blue, bearing weapons, robust ear, heard your determined voice launched forth again and again, year that suddenly sang by the months of that round lipid canning, I repeat you, hurrying, crashing, sad, distracted year. Walt Whitman loved going to the opera. He loved Italian opera. And indeed, we will find out what he was doing the night that he found out in April 1861 that the Civil War had commenced. Opening of the Secession War. News of the attack on Fort Sumter and the flag at Charleston Harbor, South Carolina, was received in New York City late at night, 13th April, 1861 and was immediately sent out in extras of the newspapers. I had been to the opera on 14th Street that night, and after the performance was walking down Broadway toward 12 o'clock on my way to Brooklyn, when I heard in the distance the loud cries of the newsboys, who came presently tearing and yelling up the street, rushing from side to side even more furiously than usual. I bought an extra and crossed to the Metropolitan Hotel, Niblo's, where the great lamps were still brightly blazing. And with a crowd of others who gathered impromptu, read the news, which was evidently authentic. For the benefit of some who had no papers, one of us read the telegram aloud, while all listened silently and attentively. No remark was made by any of the crowd, which had increased to 30 or 40, but all stood a minute or two before they dispersed. I can almost see them there now, under the lamps at midnight again. Michael will continue with another reading from Specimen Days in which Whitman tells us uh, as uh, the continued support the nation was getting to fight the war. National Uprising and Volunteering. I have said somewhere that the three presidentiads preceding 1861 showed how the weakness and wickedness of rulers are just as eligible here in America on the Republican influences as in Europe with under dynastic influences. But what can I say of that prompt and splendid wrestling with secession slavery, the arch enemy personified, the instant he unmistakably showed his face? The volcanic upheaval of the nation after that firing on the flag at Charleston proved for certain something which had been previously in great doubt and at once substantially, substantially settled the question of disunion. In my judgment, it will remain as the grandest and most encouraging spectacle yet, vouchsafed in any age, old or new, to political progress and democracy. It was not for what came to the surface merely, though that was important, but what it indicated below, which was of eternal importance. Down in the abysms of new world humanity, there had formed and hardened a primal hard pan of national union will, determined and in the majority refusing to be tampered with or argued against, confronting all emergencies and capable at any time of bursting all surface bonds and breaking out like an earthquake. It is indeed the best lesson of the century or of America and it is a mighty privilege to have been a part of it. Two great spectacles, immortal proofs of democracy, unequaled in all the history of the past, are furnished by the secession war. One at the beginning, the other at its end. Those are the general, voluntary, armed upheaval and the peaceful and harmonious disbanding of the armies in the summer of 1865. At the beginning of the Civil War, the feeling was on both the side of the South and the side of the North that this was going to be a quick war, maybe lasting four to six weeks at most. So as reality sets in, we hear a nation starting to question if the right decisions were made. 
we're going to start to hear about some of these questions uh, with Katie's excerpt from Specimen Days. <clears throat> Contemptuous feeling. Even after the bombardment of Sumter, however, the gravity of the revolt and the power and will of the slave states for a strong and continued military resistance to national authority were not at all realized at the North except by a few. Nine-tenths of the people of the free states looked upon the rebellion as started in South Carolina from a feeling one half of contempt and the other half composed of anger and incredulity. It was not thought it would be joined in by Virginia, North Carolina, or Georgia. A great and cautious national official predicted that it would blow over in 60 days, and folks generally believed the prediction. I remember talking about it on a Fulton ferry boat with the Brooklyn mayor, who said he only hoped the Southern fire eaters would commit some overt act of resistance, as they would be then at once so effectually squelched we would never hear of secession again. But he was afraid they never would have the pluck to really do anything. I remember, too, that a couple of companies of the 13th Brooklyn, who rendezvoused at the city armory and started thence as 30 days men, were all provided with pieces of rope, conspicuously tied to their musket barrels, with which to bring back each man a prisoner from the audacious South, to be led in a noose on our men's early and triumphant return. In July 1861, the Union defeat at the Battle of Bull Run was disaster for the morale of the North. Battle of Bull Run, July 1861. All this sort of feeling was destined to be arrested and reversed by a terrible shock. The Battle of First Bull Run. Certainly, as we know it now, one of the most singular fights on record. All battles and their results are far more matters of accident than is generally thought. But, but this was throughout a casualty, a chance. Each side supposed it had won till the last moment. One had, in point of fact, just the same right to be routed as the other. By a fiction or a series of fictions, the national forces at the last moment exploded in a panic and fled from the field. The defeated troops commenced pouring into Washington over the Long Bridge at daylight on Monday the 22nd. Day drizzling all through with rain. The Saturday and Sunday of the battle, 20th and 21st, had been parched and hot to an extreme. The dust, the grime, and smoke in layers, sweated in, followed by other layers, again sweated in, absorbed by those excited souls. Their clothes all saturated with the clay powder filling the air, stirred up everywhere on the dry roads and trodden fields by the regiments, swarming wagons and our artillery. All the men with this coating of murk and sweat and rain, now recoiling back, pouring over the long bridge a horrible march of 20 miles, returning to Washington baffled, humiliated, and panic-struck. Where are the vaunts and the proud boasts with which you went forth? Where are your banners and your bands of music and your ropes to bring back your prisoners? Well, there isn't a band playing, and there isn't a flag, but clings ashamed and lank to its staff. The sun rises, but shines not. Even in the face of this defeat, the North began to rally. The stupor passes, something else begins. But the hour, the day, the night passed, and whatever returns, an hour, a day, a night like this, can never again return. The President recovering himself, begins that very night sternly, rapidly sets about the task of reorganizing his forces and placing himself in position for future and sure work. If there were nothing else of Abraham Lincoln for history to stamp him with, it is enough to send him with this wreath to the memory of all future time that he endured that hour, that day, that bitter than gall, 
indeed a crucifixion day, that it did not conquer him, that he unflinchingly stemmed it and resolved to lift himself and the union out of it. Then the great New York papers at once appeared, commencing that evening and following it up the next morning and incessantly, incessantly through many days afterwards, with leaders that rang out over the land with the loudest, most reverberating ring of clearest bugles, full of encouragement, hope, inspiration, unfaltering defiance. Those magnificent editorials, they never flagged for a fortnight. The Herald commenced them. I remember the articles well. The Tribune was equally cogent and inspiriting. And the Times, Evening Post, and other principal papers were not a whit behind. They came in good time, for they were needed. For in the humiliation of Bull Run, the popular feel feeling North, from its extreme of superciliousness, recoiled to the depth of gloom and apprehension. Of all the days of the war, there are two I especially can never forget. Those were the day following the news in New York and Brooklyn of that first full Bull Run defeat, and the day of Abraham Lincoln's death. I was home in Brooklyn on both occasions. The day of the murder, we heard the news very early in the morning. Mother prepared breakfast and other meals afterwards, as usual. But not a mouthful was eaten all day by either of us. We each drank half a cup of coffee. That was all. Little was said. We got every newspaper, morning and evening, and the frequent extras of that period, and passed them silently to each other. In the next poem by Walt Whitman, we hear even Walt Whitman crying for war. Beat, beat drums. Beat, beat drums. Blow, bugles blow. Through the windows, through doors, burst like a ruthless force. Into the solemn church and scatter the congregation. Into the school where the scholar is studying. Leave not the bridegroom quiet. No happiness must he have now with his bride. Nor the peaceful farmer any peace, plowing his field or gathering his grain. So fierce you whir and pound you drums, so shrill you bugles blow. Beat, beat drums, blow, bugles blow. Over the traffic of cities, over the rumble of wheels in the streets. Are beds prepared for sleepers at night in the houses? No sleepers must sleep in those beds. No bargainers bargains by day. No brokers or speculators. Would they continue? Would the talkers be talking? Would the singer attempt to sing? Would the lawyer rise in the court to state his case before the judge? Then rattle quicker, heavier drums. You bugles wilder blow. Beat, beat, drums, blow, bugles, blow. Make no parley, stop for no expostulation. Mind not the timid, mind not the weeper or the prayer. Mind not the old man beseeching the young man. Let not the child's voice be heard, nor the mother's entreaties. Make even the trestles to shake the dead where they lie awaiting their hearses. So strong you thump, O terrible drums, so loud you bugles blow. And at this time that Whitman was writing this poetry, others were all, was also writing poetry to rally the North. For example, Julia Ward Howe with the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. I 
have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling camps. They have builded him an altar in the evening dews and damps. I can read his righteous sentence by the dim and flaring lamps. His day is marching on. He has sounded forth a trumpet that shall never sound retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, and answer him. Be dutiful, my feet. Our God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Our God is marching on. December 1862, Walt Whitman's younger brother, George Washington Whitman, who has enlisted as a private on the Union side, is wounded. Whitman and his family finds out about this accident by reading a New York City newspaper where his brother's last name is misspelled. Whitman immediately decides to travel to the front to find and to comfort his wounded brother. On his way down, passing through Philadelphia, he is pickpocketed. So he shows up in the federal city without not one cent on him. Happy coincidence, he meets one of the publishers of the third edition of Leaves of Grass who is now working as a clerk, someone who will be instrumental in finding Walt Whitman a job in Washington, D.C. when Whitman decides that he will remain in Washington and not return home to his family in Brooklyn, New York. Let's hear about the Battle of Fredericksburg and its aftermath. After First Fredericksburg, December 23rd to 31st, 1862. The results of the late battle are exhibited everywhere, about here in thousands of cases. Hundreds die every day. In the camp, brigade, and division hospitals. These are merely tents, and sometimes very poor ones. The wounded lying on the ground, lucky if they have blankets or spreads on layers of pine or hemlock twigs or small leaves, no cots, seldom even a mattress. It is pretty cold. The ground is frozen hard and there's occasional snow. I go around from one case to another. I do not see that I do much to these wounded and dying, but I cannot leave them. Once in a while, some youngster holds on to me convulsively and I do what I can for him. At any rate, stop with him and sit near him for hours, if he wishes it. Besides the hospitals, I also go occasionally on long tours through the camps, talking with the men, sometimes at night among the groups, around the fires, in their shebang enclosures of bushes. These are curious shows, full of characters and groups. I soon get acquainted anywhere in camp, with officers or men, and I'm always well used. Sometimes I go down on picket with the regiments I know best. As to rations, the army, are, the army here at present seems to be tolerably well supplied, and the men have enough such as it is, mainly salt pork and hard tack. Most of the regiments lodge in the flimsy shelter tents. A few have built themselves huts of logs and mud with fireplaces. Washington, D.C. was an armed city, now taking back literally tens of thousands of sick, wounded, and dying soldiers. Let's hear about this story. Back to Washington. January 1863. Left camp at Falmouth with some wounded a few days since and came here by Aquia Creek Railroad and on government steamer up the Potomac. Many wounded were with us on the cars and boat 
The cars were just common platform ones. The railroad journey of 10 or 12 miles was made mostly before sunrise. The soldiers guarding the, rail, the road came out from their tents or shebangs of bushes with rumpled hair and half awake look. Those on duty were walking their posts, some on the banks over us, others down far below the level of the track. I saw large cavalry camps off the road. At Aquia Creek Landing were numbers of wounded going north. I waited some three hours. I went around among them. Several wanted word sent home to parents, brothers, wives, which I did for them by mail the next day from Washington. On the boat, I had my hands full. One poor fellow died going up. I am now remaining in and around Washington, daily visiting the hospitals and much in patent office, 8th Street, H Street, Armory Square, and others. I am now able to do a little good, having money and getting experience. Today, Sunday afternoon, until 9 in the evening, visited Campbell Hospital, attended specially to one case in Ward 1, very sick with pleurisy and typhoid fever. Young man, farmer's son, D.F. Russell, Company E, 60th New York. Downhearted and feeble, a long time before he would take any interest, wrote a letter home to his mother in Malone, Franklin County, New York. Gave him some fruit and one or two other gifts. Enveloped and directed his letter, then went thoroughly through Ward 6, observed every case in the ward without, I think, missing one. Gave perhaps from 20 to 30 persons each one some little gift, such as oranges, apples, sweet crackers, and figs. Thursday, January 21st. Devoted the main part of the day to Armory Square Hospital. Went pretty thoroughly through wards F, G, H, and I, some 50 cases in each ward. In ward F, supplied the men throughout with writing paper and stamped envelope each. Distributed in small portions to proper subjects, a large jar of first-rate preserved berries, which had been donated to me by a lady, her own cooking. Found several cases I thought good subjects for small sums of money, which I furnished. The wounded men often come up broke, and it helps their spirits to have even the small sum I give them. My paper and envelopes all gone, but distributed a good lot of amusing reading matter. Also, as I thought, judicious tobacco, oranges, apples. Interesting cases in Ward I. Charles Miller, bed 19, Company D, 53rd Pennsylvania, is only 16 years of age, very bright, courageous boy. Left leg amputated below the knee. Next bed to him, another young lad, very sick. Gave each appropriate gifts. In the bed above also, amputation of the left leg. Gave him a little jar of raspberries. Bed one, this ward gave a small sum, also to a soldier on crutches, sitting on his bed near. I am more and more surprised at the very great proportion of youngsters from 15 to 21 in the army. I afterwards found a still greater proportion among the Southerners. Evening, same day. Went to see DFR before alluded to. Found him remarkably changed for the better. Up and dressed, quite a triumph. He afterwards got well and went back to his regiment. Distributed in the wards a quantity of note paper and 40 or 50 stamped envelopes of which I had recruited my stock and the men were in much need. in the army hospitals, in the makeshift army hospitals of Washington, D.C. were dismal, things were even worse on the field. 50 hours left wounded on the field. Here is the case of a soldier I found among the crowded cots at the patent office. He likes to have someone to talk to, and we will listen to him. He got badly hit on his leg and side at Fredericksburg that eventful Saturday, 13th of December. He lay the succeeding two days and nights helpless on the field between the city and those grim terraces of batteries. His company and regiment had been compelled to leave him to his fate. To make matters worse, it happened he lay with his head slightly downhill 
and could not help himself. At the end of some 50 hours, he was brought off with other wounded under a flag of truce. I asked him how the rebels treated him as he lay during those two days and nights within reach of them, whether they came to him, whether they abused him. He answers that several of the rebels, soldiers, and others came to him at one time and another. A couple of them who were together spoke roughly and sarcastically, but nothing worse. One middle-aged man, however, who seemed to be moving around the field among the dead and wounded for benevolent purposes, came to him in a way he will never forget. Treated our soldier kindly, bound up his wounds, cheered him, gave him a couple of biscuits and a drink of whiskey and water. Asked him if he could eat some beef. This good secesh, however, did not change our soldier's position, for it might have caused the blood to burst from the wound, clotted and stagnated. Our soldier from Pennsylvania has had a pretty severe time. The wounds proved to be bad ones, but he retains a good heart and is at present on the gain. It is not uncommon for men to be remained on the field this way for one, two, four, or even five days. Hospital thieves and persons. Letter writing. When eligible, I encourage the men to write, and myself, when called upon, write all sorts of letters for them, including love letters, very tender ones. Almost as I reel off these memoranda, I write for a new patient to his wife of the 17th Connecticut Company H has just come up February 17th from Windmill Point and is received in Ward H, Armory Square. He is an intelligent looking man, has a foreign accent, black eyed and hair, a Hebraic appearance. Once a telegraphic message sent to his wife, New Canaan, Connecticut. I agree to send the message but to make sure I also sit down and write the wife a letter and dispatch it to the post office immediately as he fears she will come on and he does not wish her to as he will surely get well. Saturday, January 30th, afternoon, visited Campbell Hospital. Scene of cleaning up the ward and giving the men all clean clothes. Through the ward, the patients dressing or being dressed the naked upper half of bodies, the good humor and fun, the shirts, drawers, sheets of bed, and the general fixing up for Sunday. Gave JL 50 cents. Wednesday, February 4th. Visited Armory Hospital. Went pretty thoroughly through wards E and D. Supplied paper and envelopes to, ho to all who wished as usual, found plenty of men who needed those articles. Wrote letters. Saw and talked with two or three members of the Brooklyn 14th Regiment. A poor fellow in Ward D with a fearful wound, in a fearful condition, was having some loose splinters of bone taken from the neighborhood of the wound. The operation was long and one of great pain. Yet. After it was well commenced, the soldier, the soldier bored in silence. He sat up, propped, was much wasted, had lain a long time quiet in one position, not only for days, but for weeks. A bloodless, brown-skinned face with eyes full of determination belonged to a New York regiment. There was an unusual cluster of surgeons, medical cadets, and nurses around his bed. I thought the whole thing was done with tenderness and done well. In one case, the wife sat by the side of her husband. His sickness, typhoid fever, pretty bad. In another, by the side of her son, a mother. She told me she had seven children and this was the youngest. A fine, kind, healthy, gentle mother. Good looking, not very old with a cap on her head and dressed like home. What a charm it gave to the whole ward. I liked the woman nurse in Ward E. 
I noticed how she sat a long time by a poor fellow who just had that morning, an addition, in addition to his other sicknesses, bad hemorrhage. She gently assisted him, relieved him of the blood, holding a cloth to his mouth as he coughed it up. He was so weak, he could only just turn his head over on the pillow. One young New York man with a bright, handsome face had been lying several months from the most disagreeable wound received at Bull Run. A bullet had shot him right through the bladder, hitting him front, low on the belly, and coming out back. He had suffered much. The water came out of the wound by slow but steady quantities for many weeks, so that he lay almost constantly in a sort of puddle. And there were the other disagreeable circumstances. He was of good heart, however, at presently comparatively comfortable, had a bad throat, was delighted with the stick of whorehound candy I gave him with one or two other trifles. If you were to visit Washington, D.C., you could visit the <coughs> a National Portrait Gallery, a magnificent old building from the early, from the early 19th century. This building was originally the U.S. Patent Office, and it's where inventors would have to send in miniature models, patent models, of their inventions to make sure that their rights were protected as the creators of these inventions. During the Civil War, this was one of the many makeshift hospitals to go up during, uh, through, through the city, and it's one of the hospitals that Walt Whitman often went to visit. Ironically, once uh, it was cleared out of being an army hospital. In March of 1865, the U.S. Patent Office was also the scene of Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural ball. Uh, ball. Let's hear about Walt Whitman's visit to the Patent Office. Patent Office Hospital, February 23rd, 1863. I must not let the great hospital at the Patent Office pass away without some mention. A few weeks ago, the vast area of the second story of that noblest of Washington buildings was crowded close with rows of sick, badly wounded, and dying soldiers. They were placed in three very large apartments. I went there many times. It was a strange, solemn, and with all its features of suffering and death, a sort of fascinating sight. I go sometimes at night to soothe and relieve particular cases. Two of the immense apartments are filled with high and ponderous glass cases, crowded with models in miniature of every kind of utensil, machine, or invention it ever entered into the mind of man to conceive, and with curiosities and foreign presence. Between these cases are lateral openings, perhaps eight feet wide and quite deep. And in these were placed the sick, besides a great long double row of them up and down through the middle of the hall. Many of them were very bad cases, wounds, and amputations. Then there was a gallery running above the hall in which there were beds also. It was indeed a curious scene, especially at night when lit up. The glass cases, the beds, the forms lying there, the gallery above and the marble pavement underfoot, the suffering, and the fortitude to bear it in various degrees. Occasionally, from some, the groan that could not be repressed. Sometimes a poor fellow dying with emaciated face and glassy eye, the nurse by his side, the doctor there also, but no friend, no relative. Such were the sights, but lately in the patent office. The wounded have since been removed from there, and it is now vacant again. At the same time that Walt Whitman was experiencing these scenes from the American Civil War, a new art form was being published for the first time in the United States. It had to wait until the start of the Civil War because it could, before it could be published, because it was coded poetry. It was the Negro spiritual in which the person singing asked for freedom. Obviously, this had to be done in a secret way. It would not be tolerated in the South. One of the very first Negro spirituals published in the United States in the early 1860s was the song, Go Down Moses. We will now hear it sung by 
Brooklyn contralto, Nicole Mitchell. to help him through, and that is nature. We will now have Tyler conclude our reading with a return to an excerpt from Specimen Days. The White House by Moonlight, February 24th, 1863. A spell of fine, soft weather. I wander about a good deal, sometimes at night, under the moon. Tonight, took a long look at the President's house, the white portico, the palace-like tall, round columns, spotless as snow. The walls also. The tender and soft moonlight flooding the pale marble and making peculiar, faint, languishing shades, not shadows. Everywhere, a soft, transparent, hazy, thin, blue moon lace hanging in the air. The brilliant and extra plentiful clusters of gas on and around the facade, columns, portico, everything so white so marbly, pure, and dazzling, yet soft. The White House of future poems and of dreams and dramas, there in the soft and copious moon, the gorgeous front in the trees and under the lustrous flooding moon, full of reality, full of illusion. The forms of the trees, leafless, silent, in trunk and myriad angles of branches under the stars and sky, the White House of the land, and of beauty and night. Sentries at the gate and by the portico, silent. Pacing there in blue overcoats, stopping you not at all, but eyeing you with sharp eyes, whichever way you move. Ladies and gentlemen, let's have a round of applause for all our participants today. 